Well, welcome uh, to a talk on view three and machine learning. Um, so we're going to be walking through a demo app um, at the end of the slide portion here. So this QR code will take you to the repo um, to download the code. And I'll be giving a few opportunities uh, throughout the talk to, to go ahead and, and download this. My name is Will Marple, uh, full stack web dev. I work at an agency called Black Airplane. Um, we specialize in um, mobile and web full stack uh, application development. So you'll need one thing to get the demo app up and running, and that's a Pexels API key. Um, instructions are in the README as well. Um, so I'll wait just a moment for everybody to capture those. And I will show this one more time at the end of the slide portion as well. So I uh, need to give credit where credit's due. My, uh, this talk was inspired by uh, a talk my friend Gant uh, gave at Render. And he has graciously uh, signed and brought several of his books on TensorFlow.js. Uh, I have put up a little Laravel site at tfjs.org. Um, so if you would love to learn about TensorFlow.js, um, go ahead and sign up and I will draw a few names out of my digital hat at the end of the talk and give away a few of his books. So what are we going to talk about today? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my thoughts on AI and how it's impacting my professional life and how I'm approaching it. Um, we're going to have an overview of what TFJS is um, and how to get started with it. We're going to talk a little bit about the pros and cons and maybe some target use cases. Uh, we'll talk about an overview of the various models and packages I'm using in the demo app. Um, and then we'll uh, show the app and walk through the code a little bit to explain what's going on. So I'm sure most of us in this room are familiar with what machine learning is, um, but just real quick, it's a subset of, of AI that focuses on behavior not being explicitly programmed, but instead um, being derived from that algorithm's experience and uh, data that is available to it. Um, so we're going to be dealing primarily with pre-trained models, models that are ready to go. Um, and those are the result of work of data scientists at Google, generally speaking, um, building these models and feeding them vast amounts of data. Um, the product of that being these pre-trained models um, that are ready to use. And third point, um, I just like to bring up, like for me, um, as an application developer that doesn't come from like a data science and machine learning background, I'm trying to bring down the mental overhead as I, you know, get more familiar familiarity with this um, technology. So just like anything else, like we don't, I don't think a lot about how Google engineers built the the. the web service that's behind the directions API when I send it some input and expect some output from it. And that's kind of how we can think about these pre-trained models. They need some sort of input and we can expect some predictive output. Um, so why? Like I'm sure many of you are in a similar boat to me where your, your professional days um, or professional time is spent building application features. Like should I spend time familiarizing myself with machine learning? Like how big of a deal is this going to become for me in the coming months and years? And so I feel like AIG is out of the bottle, meaning like recognizing that AI has been a field of study for many decades. I'm really just talking about modern advancements, how we're kind of in a hype cycle and uh, you know, buffeted to and fro by uh, peaks and valleys. I think that a lot of the various tools like ChatGBT, BARD, MidJourney, Stable Diffusion are gonna continue to iterate. They're gonna, gonna continue to, to amaze us with the things that they can do. And that's gonna kind of translate into um, business requirements coming down the pike to us as application engineers. Like, how can you build this kind of feature into my app? So what's a developer to do? Um, you know, if you're anything like me, at times it can feel a bit overwhelming and kind of uh, develop the expectation that, well, if that's the case, then my workplace will just hire some ML engineers and they will deal with this because that's a different field. Um, and that's really not how I'm approaching it. I think that, yes, um, there will continue to be an increased need for those kinds of engineers, but that's also going to be an increased need um, in the application development space, our space, to understand how these things work and integrate them into the app features we're building. So um, 
hype cycles. It can feel like a roller coaster sometimes, like not just a few weeks ago, the internet was full of fear um, about Devin. Now it's largely recognized as a hoax. This week, everybody's hyped up about GPT-4.0 and just up and down. So like, we can't live our professional lives this way, right? We've got to find some balance. Um, and I think TensorFlow.js, it offers an opportunity to start really getting your hands on some AI and machine learning um, at a low time investment cost. So I'm advocating for excitement and curiosity, not fear. So as technologists, I think we're uniquely positioned to gain a deep understanding of these technologies and how we could introduce them and some of them into our apps um, and use our existing knowledge to thought lead and explore and shape our workplaces and industries. Um, and I think that we have an incredible opportunity to allow some of these technologies as they're maturing um, to impact our efficiencies um, and iterate more quickly. So why TFJS? Um, so in a word, inference in the browser. It's really cool. So a different way of interacting with this technology than you know, many other uh, opportunities like OpenAI's API. Um, also can run on the server in a Node.js environment. Low barrier to entry. Uh, it works alongside popular frameworks and tools, client-side ML library, as I said. Leverages WebGL to get access to hardware um, to get better performance on the kinds of operations that machine learning algorithms need to do. Um, and it's flexible and versatile. Um, you can start with the pre-trained models and then either refine them or build your own models from scratch. Uh, when should you use TFJS? So like anything else, um, there are only trade-offs, no silver bullets, right? Um, in browsers, we talked about, so privacy, I think privacy is, in my mind, one of the most compelling reasons why you would want to use in-browser client-side inference. Um, you're, it's just taking away a threat vector. You're not having to send, like if your use case requires that you send potentially sensitive data or it's undesirable to send that data over the wire, um, privacy could be compelling for you. Um, it's flexible, so works in all browsers and Node.js environments, and it's just JS. So it works with our favorite framework as well as any other framework. Um, cons, I would say, if you're going to use this in a production app, there's going to be prototyping necessary. You're going to need to define the kinds of devices and, and ideally browsers that you want to target and thoroughly test for performance, you know, the model size. It is limited to just JavaScript. So if you need interop with other languages and things, that could potentially be a barrier for you. Um, and I've never personally run into this myself, but in my research, I've found that some people have run into certain browser limitations for certain models. So you're just going to want to prototype and test thoroughly if it's headed for production. Um, <clears throat> so TensorFlow Hub, what can you do with TFJS? This is really where we're going to live for this talk is kind of using models that are ready to go out of the box and exploring what they can do. Um, transfer learning. Um, so the way I describe this one most often is I read this interesting article about a dev team who needed to identify some diseased leaves in a certain set of plant species. So they found a pre-trained model that could do just that. It just couldn't do it for the species they wanted. And so they used their own data set to refine that model's behavior to be able to identify it on the plant species they wanted. So the benefits here, are less data required to accomplish that goal, um, which means faster training and lower computational needs. Common use cases would be image classification, like I just described, or sentiment analysis. So maybe it's a general purpose sentiment analysis, but you want to refine it to be really great at deter uh, performing inference on movie reviews or something of that nature. Um, I'm not going to read through all of these, but I just have this slide here to kind of highlight that there is a broad range of different types of behavior available to you on TensorFlow Hub. So if you're thinking, hey, this could be cool, I have an idea for something I want to use TFJS for, there's likely a pre-trained model that is at least a starting point for the thing that you want to, to do. So let's go over <clears throat> um, 
the packages and models that we're going to be using. The first one is object classification using the COCO SSD model. Um, COCO describes the data set that was used, common objects in context. Um, SSD is the type of algorithm that does the detection, single shot multi-box detection. Key features, speed, diversity, and accuracy. So it's optimized for real-time processing for images and video. Um, it's, it covers a very broad range um, of different object class types, um, and it's pretty accurate. The detection algorithm is pretty accurate. Um, the second one is a JavaScript package called Face API JS, and under the hood, it's leveraging several TensorFlow JS models to um, introduce these features. Uh, the first one is face detection, so where in the image are the faces? Uh, second one, landmarks, eyes, ears, nose, uh, that sort of thing. Um, recognition, meaning Gantz in these five photos, Will's in these three photos. Um, uh, motion detection, that's one thing that I've implemented uh, in my demo. Uh, and then age and gender recognition. So what are we building here, or what has been built? Uh, the idea is really just a proof of, proof of concept. Obviously, you'd never ship something like this, but it's just to show off what this, these models can do. So the idea is a little social media feed where we're starting to build out um, an AI uh, algorithm that is figuring out what objects are in these images, how long did the person dwell and look at the image, and then how did they feel about it as they were looking at it? So it would be kind of the beginnings of showing you more relevant posts um, that you like better or e even better advertisements. So we're about to jump in here to the demo and the code. So for uh, anyone that needs to download the repo, um, this is the chance. And I think we are good there. Cool, so I'm gonna go ahead and start out. Go, let's see how we do here. Uh, I need to connect it to my phone, the Wi-Fi. Okay, let's see if we've got internet now. Cool. All right, so I'll zoom in here just a little bit so you can see the emotions. You can see it found some sheep in this object. We're kind of keeping track how long I've looked at this post. And if I get happy, angry, <laughs> it thinks I'm sad, surprised. Uh, you guys didn't know you're getting method acting today um, <laughs> while I was doing this, but we'll scro scroll through a few more um, here. And it looks like, there we go. Found a parking meter, some toothbrushes, some people. Um, so yeah, you guys get the idea. So let's go through and look at some code uh, and talk a little bit about how this has been implemented. So Feed.view is where we want, really want to start. It's a pretty simple component here where we've just got the video element that's um, representing the, the, the webcam feed there. And then we're iterating over some posts. Um, <clears throat> we go out to the Pexels API and um, we get a random class first. The reason that we use Pexels is because these are all of the various object types that Coco SSD can detect in an image. So we're just picking a random one and calling out to Pexels and say, hey, get me an image that would work with Coco SSD. Ideally, if you were doing this for your own project, you would refine the model for whatever target types you would need in your images. Um, but all that being said, I'll start with the more boring stuff. So intersection observer is how we're figuring out the dwell. Um, most of you are probably familiar with this, but it's a pretty cool JavaScript API where we can figure out intersection of two objects in the DOM. Uh, in this case, it's the post and the viewport. So um, you'll notice the dwell will will go. Oh, I got a. It will go when you're looking at it, and then as it gets close to the top, it stops. Um, and so that intersection observer is how that dwell is working. Now onto the more fun stuff: image classification. 
So in the image classification, like this is how easy it was to, to pull this in. Like I literally just installed the Coco SSD package and, and the TensorFlow JS core package. Um, and then I import Coco SSD here and it's as simple as uh, initializing it, you get an uh, initialized model. And then that, once that promise resolves, the model is ready to receive input. Um, this is some acrobatics here to get around cores, but I'm basically just building up the image data that I need to feed the model. Line 24 is where the fun stuff is happening, where we get another promise here. And then once that work is complete, we get our predictions. Um, and at that point, I am just reaching into my Pina store and applying some um, predictions to the post. So if we go ahead and look at Pina here, probably have to, oops, not Lighthouse. Let me get rid of that. And refresh here, have a look at Pina. And if we look in our posts, we will start to see in the first one here, some predictions coming through. And this is, so this is where that um, data is coming from. If you look in Pina and you're wondering, where did predictions come from? It's coming from this composable um, and it's happening as the result of this model inference being run here. So on next to face API. So this is the, this is arguably the coolest, uh, <laughs> the coolest part of it. So, um, Similarly, just in, uh, installed the Vlad Mandic version of Face API. So I did want to I did want to mention that if you look for Face API JS, you're likely going to find this one, and it's abandoned. However, um, someone has forked it and kept it up to date, um, and that's the Vlad Mandic Face API. We have here and this guy has kept this thing up to date and he's even added more features to it and it's super cool. Um, I also want to note that he has a project that supersedes this one um, called human. And human adds all kinds of cool new features. So in addition to everything face API does, it also can do like body pose tracking. It can do hand and gesture um, tracking, gaze tracking, iris. So it can, you can implement like a face, a face ID kind of thing, which could be cool with com um, combined with the privacy benefit that you get there. Um, so lots of neat things that you can do. And he even has a little demo site built up and it's going to try to steal my phone Oh, nope. There we go. Cool. So, yeah, a lot going on here. Um, obviously, can do all kinds of hand and gesture recognition um, and gives you an interface to turn off some of this so you can start to, to turn down the noise a bit. Um, but anyway human it, super cool if i were going to take this project and tinker and play around with it i would highly recommend pulling human in and um, integrating some of that into the project cool so um heading over to the face api stuff um it's very similar workflow here we're loading up some models um, he's got great documentation that will guide you through this but um, i'm tracking the models in the repo these are the binaries that are required to perform the inference, but same flow, uh, need to load and initialize these models. Um, once they are ready, uh, we're waiting until that video element is present, getting the uh, webcam feed, then starting the emotion tracking. Um, and then once we have some detected emotion uh, emotions, we are again, then play, reaching into the Pina store and placing them here on adding emotions to visible posts. So if we head back over, we'll point out again, very similarly on this post object, we also have some emotions. Um, so you could, you'll see it change as I uh, change my emotions. Um, <clears throat> so 
where would you take this next? I added these bullet points to the README. So if you want to take this and tinker with it, um, though these points will be there as well. Um, but what could you do with this? Low hanging fruit. This package already has age and gender recognition. It literally is a, as simple as um, chaining on methods. So you can load those models and chain them here and you could almost for free get age and gender recognition. Um, object classification from the webcam feed. Um, facial recognition or some sort of like face ID, face detect, um, uh, emotion duration tracking. So you could mature the emotion tracking of like keep a duration of how long they felt that way. Um, and then you could refine the algorithm further. Um, gaze detection and marrying that up with different objects that have been defined. So one of the things Coco SSD can do, not demonstrated here, is create a box around the things that it has identified. And so you could kind of marry that with gaze tracking to figure out, oh, they're actually looking at this piece of pie or, or whatever it is that's in the image. Um, so audio recognition, you know, babies crying, dogs barking, you know, that sort of thing. So the, the sky is really the limit. And I think there's a lot that you could do to tinker uh, around in this project. Um, so uh, we're nearing the end here. Um, please, uh, if you so desire, connect with me on Twitter or LinkedIn um, at Will Marple. And without further ado, thank you and let's give away some books.